Hey everyone, it's Sauce, and today I'm doing a CDT Q&A based on questions that you all asked me on Instagram and YouTube. As we approach a new hiking season and a new class of thru-hikers is ready to embark on America's best long trails, I am acutely aware of the pre-hike jitters that come along with that. A million questions begin to run through your head, or at least they do mine. And sometimes hearing from someone who's been through it can be the insight that you need to just take a step back and relax and enjoy this exciting time. Because of that, I decided to answer some questions on what you can expect on the Continental Divide Trail specifically. Like I said, I put Hold my Instagram and YouTube communities to see what their most pressing questions were about through hiking in the Continental Divide Trail. And the questions cover a wide range of topics. They range from the ever-present dilemma of whether you should hike north or south, best and worst resupply spots on the CDT, where to send boxes on the CDT, what CDT alternates you should take, how to deal with the water sources on the CDT, what to do about bears on the CDT, comparing the CDT to the PCT, and more. These answers are based on my experience hiking the CDT northbound in 2022, so keep that in mind as we go through all the questions. Obviously, the trail changes every year, and in your experience and literal mileage may vary. So first up, Nobo versus Sobo on the CDT, flip-flopping, and start date question. Should you hike the CDT northbound or southbound? While I personally hike the CDT northbound, many agree that the CDT is inherently more of a southbound trail. What will work best for you will depend on a lot of factors that are typically determined in the winter before you hike, so not always in advance enough for you to make a decision northbound or southbound with that information. A lot of it depends on the Colorado and Montana snowpacks. And knowing what they're going to be like in any given summer is almost impossible to determine until March of each year. You can kind of gauge trends, but you're not going to know exactly where it's going to fall. And of course, that time frame doesn't leave a lot of time for people hoping to hike northbound typically starting in mid-April. My general answer to this question is frustratingly just it depends. The year that I hiked happened to be a very frustrating year to hike southbound. They dealt with a lot of snow, a late season big snowstorm in Montana. And because of that, a lot of snow melt in the Bob Marshall wilderness, which made water crossings very challenging. And then when they got to the San Juans, our monsoon season in Colorado was very late that year, which meant they dealt with a lot more storms than you typically would on a southbound through hike. And then when they got to the Gila, it was flooded. So they had to take the high route through that section, which I think is kind of just a bummer. Taking the Gila alternate is really just so gorgeous. It's worth going back for it, in my opinion. There was also a bear closure in Glacier when they went through because a cow had gotten loose or out somehow. They died over the winter, froze, and then they were thawing out and basically created an all-you-can-eat grizzly bear buffet. So there were entire sections of Glacier that were closed. Some people had to roadwalk in Glacier, which absolute bummer. So obviously not the best year for southbound, but that isn't always the case. Typically hiking southbound requires hiking a little bit faster, but results in like a better weather window overall because you leave from Montana ideally in mid June. And because it's lower in elevation, you don't have to deal with quite too much snow. You can typically make it through Colorado in the San Juans, hopefully before super late in September when we start to get our first snows of the year. And then you can kind of take your time in New Mexico or speed through it now that you have trail legs. And honestly, some of those roadwalks would have been really nice to have trail legs on and just kind of run through them. On the other hand, hiking northbound, I think mid-April makes the most sense to start. You're going to be at least some of the desert heat that way without getting to the San Juans in Colorado super early. So you've got about 800 miles of New Mexico to hike before you hit the Colorado border, which is where the San Juans begin. We ended up having a 150 mile fire closure at the end of New Mexico, which put us to the San Juans like way too early. We were there in late May. And even though snow was melting really fast the year that we hiked, it was still a lot to deal with. We made it through, but it wasn't ideal conditions. Although in any six month through hike, I don't think you're gonna get ideal conditions in every single section. That's just not the way it's set up. That being said, in an above average snow year or even like a typical snow year, we might not have been able to make it through the San Juans in late May and we would have had to flip or wait it out quite a while. So that's why northbound isn't really always the best way to go because it's really hard not to hit the San Juans too early. If you do happen to go northbound in a really high snow year and you hit the San Juans way too early, there are lower elevation alternate options. However, personally, I would recommend avoiding those at all costs 
If it's the only way you can keep hiking, of course, keep hiking, but you're gonna miss out on so much in the San Juans doing something like the Creek Cutoff, in my opinion. All that said, I do think southbound is the more reasonable way to typically hike this trail. You can navigate through Montana in typically reasonable snow conditions. You hit Colorado after the worst of monsoon season. It typically peaks the first week of August and then slows down after that. And you can use your well-earned through hiking legs to show those New Mexico roadwalks who's boss. With the low snowpack in Montana this year, I do think southbound will be a logical approach because you could start a little bit earlier and they might have some struggles with fires later in the season. My argument for a northbound hike would be in the event that Colorado has a lower than typical snow year while Montana has a higher one and you can still get through the San Juans in a reasonable amount of time um, and get New Mexico out of the way first, which I personally really liked having that done and finishing at Glacier. So really it just depends on what you're able to tolerate and what you're okay with dealing with. Another question I got was about the best flip-flop options on the CDT and I can't speak to that from personal experience, but I can say what I would potentially do if I had been in a different situation. If I was starting northbound from the New Mexico-Mexico border in April, I think it could make sense to hike all the way to Colorado and then flip from there if you you, again are in a situation where the San Juans have really high snow and it's not going to make a lot of sense to go through. You could flip up to Montana or if you got there as early as we did in 2022 in like late May you might want to take a week or two off and then flip south. Either way you would hopefully end up with less snow in Montana than are currently in the San Juan Mountains which would really be the only reason to do this kind of flip-flop in my opinion. If you're hiking southbound I don't really see any logical reasons for a flip-flop or really can't think of one that makes a lot of sense. Something else that happened a lot the year that we were hiking was people hiked north to the New Mexico, Colorado border, and then they flipped up to the Great Divide Basin and filled that in since sometimes that will have less snow than anywhere else on the trail in that time frame. However, I feel like flips like this kind of just introduce a lot of logistical challenges. And in my opinion, they end up taking more time than they save and kind of disrupt your footpath, which I think can be a whole mental hurdle to overcome. So personally, the only one I'd really consider probably is hiking north to the New Mexico, Colorado border and then flipping up to Montana and hiking back south. If you're hoping to flip flop because you're worried you're not gonna make it to Canada in time, it kind of depends how late you actually are, but keep in mind that there are definitely several alternate options up north that can shorten your hike. So you could kind of take a shortcut instead of flip-flopping if that's gonna be easier from a logistical perspective. Next question is when to start the CDT. And I think I kind of touched on this already, but just to summarize, if I was hiking northbound, I would start in mid-April so it's not too hot in the desert and I'm also not getting to the sand once too early. And if I was hiking southbound, I wouldn't wanna start any later than mid-June personally because I get afraid of snow at high elevations and I wouldn't wanna be super worried about being able to get through Colorado before October hit and we definitely even get snowstorms in late September. So for me, mid-June is kind of like the latest I'd want to start southbound, although people definitely start in early July. It just kind of depends on how fast you're able or willing to go. Next up, alternates. Which alternates should I take on the CDT? I actually did a YouTube video about my favorite alternates, so you can check that out if you're interested. However, I think the answer to this question in general ultimately depends on what you're hoping to get out of the trail. Sometimes I just really mentally needed a shortcut, so I took the shortest option possible to get between point A and point B, or just with resupply options, that made the most sense so we weren't carrying an obscene amount of food. Sometimes I really needed scenery, so I would pick the most scenic route from point A to point B, or I would take the long way just to get my feet off of roadwalks. To summarize my favorite alternates, they are the Gila River alternate. More people take this, I think, than the actual CDT, and it's one of the most gorgeous places I have ever backpacked. Narrows Rim Trail. This one gets you off the especially long roadwalk on the way into Grants, New Mexico, and it's also beautiful and rugged and requires some light route finding, so if that's your thing, definitely want to check that out. Circuit of the Towers. This is the most badass introduction to the Wind River Range you could hope for, in my opinion. Um, don't let the rumors of the blowdown scare you away. If they're still there. It's worth navigating through them to do the Circuit of the Towers. Hours. Knapsack Call is also in the Moon River range and this definitely requires extra time, extra effort, and extra route finding. Actually quite a bit of route finding, but it's 1000% worth it. Every ounce of extra effort that you put into it, you will get back out of it, in my opinion. Next is the Anaconda Cutoff. This one will save you time towards the end of the trail and take you through the amazing town of Anaconda, Montana. I think it cuts about 80 miles, um, but it also contains wonderful sections of the Anaconda Pintler Wilderness. and. Anaconda has one of the best hostels I've ever been to, so 
definitely recommend. Another bonus alternate, if you have time and are interested in peak bagging, the Colorado 14ers are really fun side trips. There's lots of opportunities for bonus miles and peaks along the CDT in Colorado. Another question I got was how do you figure out all of the CDT alternates? I think that figuring out CDT alternates looks a little bit different for every hiker, kind of depending on their preference. But personally, I use a combination of far out, Jonathan Lay maps, and then sort of my own DIY route finding. For the far out alternates, it's very straightforward. They're already programmed into the app and they're just a different color line. Um, there's usually a lot of comments about what you can expect on that alternate and you just follow it the same way you would a typical far out route. I often use these when they were a bit shorter or they were more scenic or they offered more opportunities for water. That is a huge one on the CDT. There are also a lot of alternates that sort of spring up from far out comments. Like as more and more hikers hike the CDT every year, people will discover their own alternate and they will leave comments on different waypoints saying, hey, I took this towards this direction and found X, Y, and Z. And if you have another map that has topos and you feel confident following the directions in that comment, that's another option for alternates that you can definitely take if you're wanting to just spice up your day, which I definitely did sometimes, especially if they promise, again, more water, less miles, or more scenery. As I mentioned, you can also follow the Jonathan Lay maps. He spent years hiking the CDT and refining his maps and has taken input from other hikers and created a very extensive network of alternates and waypoints on the CDT. They, these maps have existed for long before any of the other through hiking maps that I'm aware of and have been created for the sole purpose of through hiking the CDT. Over the years, he's annotated many really amazing alternates that a lot of through hikers commend as one of their favorite parts of the trail. You can also find the start of a lot of the Jonathan Lee alts in far out comments, but it's best to have the map obviously, so you know where you're going once you leave the far out line. I'll put some instructions on how to get those maps in the description of this video. There are also, like I said, my DIY alternates, and I think that the spirit of the CDT is a bit different from other long trails in that it sort of encourages adaptations and alternates just because of the nature of the way the trail is in its early stages right now. If you see something up ahead that looks interesting and you think you can reasonably reconnect back to trail, when you're examining your topos, give it a shot. Go visit the things you want to visit and go see the things you want to see. Have fun with the CDT and get lost as long as you can find your way back. Next up, we are talking food and resupply on the CDT. One question that I got a few times was what is the average resupply? I'd say the average resupply on the CDT is right around five days in between towns. I do feel like this is a little bit longer than the AT and the PCT on average. I think on the PCT, I could go like four days pretty commonly. And from what I hear about the AT, you can easily do like two to three days. Like both trails, you occasionally do have options to shorten your resupply or skip towns completely, so lengthen it. But I do think that the CDT more often pushes the limit in between towns and has less options than the other trails. There were very few times that we only went two to three days between towns, which I hear is very common on the AT. Um, this was mostly in like central Colorado. And there were several times where we went eight to nine days between towns, which I feel like really only happens like once maybe on the PCT. While the PCT does have a few longer carries like in the Sierra, I found that they were just a lot more frequent on the CDT. Going 100 plus miles in between towns definitely was not uncommon on the CDT and was almost kind of the norm. So that leads me to the longest food carry that I did on the CDT. And that was about nine days between Lander and Du Bois, Wyoming. It was 160 miles through the Wind River Range and we did choose to skip a town. There is a resupply option in the middle of the winds if you go out to Pinedale, Wyoming, but this requires like a 20 plus mile side trip and a semi unreliable hitch. So we looked 160 miles. We were like, we're in pretty good shape. We could probably do it. We love the winds. We kind of don't want to like leave in the middle of it anyway. Um, so we decided to give it a shot. We were hoping to make it through in seven days and that's how much food we brought. And that was an average of about 23 miles a day, which is fairly reasonable for a through hike, but the winds can slow you down in several different ways, which is what ended up happening to us. We had some really rough storms that um, ended up cutting days short. There was one day when we were planning and feeling good and felt like we were gonna hit our mileage, but we ended up only making it 14 miles because we hiked through like three hours of a storm and it just wasn't letting up. And then we also decided to take some more scenic alternates, which took a little bit longer. They were scrambly, they were root findy, um, and 
we didn't really wanna pass those opportunities up even though we knew we might not have enough food. So our backup plan was to leave out of a trailhead that again, we knew was a semi unreliable hitch, but we knew we were gonna hit it on a weekend and we had been there before and knew that it could actually get fairly crowded. So we were like, we'll just figure it out when we get there if we need to. Luckily, we ended up um, being able to get food from some people who were bailing off of the high route. Unfortunately, they were dealing with altitude sickness and they had to leave, but that meant that they had a bunch of extra backpacking food, which they very generously shared with us. So everything ended up working out perfectly and ended up taking us nine days and we had plenty of food for those nine days. It was honestly a lot of fun, but I did feel pretty rank by the end of those nine days. And that was my biggest complaint about being out for that long. And that brings us to the next question, which is what is the hardest resupply on the CDT and where should you send boxes? So we did prep for the towns where we felt like we would need boxes. And so I felt like all of our resupplies were fine because the places where we needed boxes to supplement, we did have them. But there are definitely a few towns on the CDT that leave a lot to be desired by way of grocery stores. So here's a list of where we sent boxes boxes and why and how I felt about the fact that we sent boxes there. So in New Mexico, we sent a box to Pie Town. You really honestly don't have another option in Pie Town besides maybe hitching out of town and there's not a lot of traffic that goes through there. It's literally dirt roads through the entire town. Um, I don't know anyone who left to go get food. I'm sure that there is a way to do it. However, there's really nothing there besides pie. Maybe you could do like apply resupply challenge. However, I wouldn't recommend the miles after Pie Town are pretty miserable. You'd want real food. And if the toaster house is still accepting packages, I would definitely recommend sending them there over the post office because I remember the post office there had kind of funky hours. Next, we sent a box to Doc Campbell's, which is in the middle of the Gila section. We heard that they had a general store there, but it was kind of mixed reviews on what the resupply would be like. I was glad we had a box there. Um, there was a decent resupply there. However, I heard from other hikers that it was fairly pricey to get everything you want. Wanted. And also, you know, you're kind of just stuck with whatever's there. Also, if you happen to get there after a lot of hikers go through, it's possible that they could be a little bit depleted because that is the only option. So I was happy with sending a box there. However, I think you could get away without it. We didn't send any resupply boxes in the entire state of Colorado, and I was fine with that decision. Um, I don't think that there was any food carries where I wish that I had. Some people will send a box to the Twin Lakes General Store. However, you really don't even need to resupply there just because of the distances between towns. If anything, you could supplement a little bit there. There's definitely a little bit of food. It's not a ton of options, but if you wanted to carry like, you know, a half resupply from the town before to the town after, that would be a good option. In Wyoming, we did not send a box. However, I wish that we had to Riverside slash Encampment. There were a lot of far out comments that were saying that like, there's a grocery store slash general store that was fine and we did resupply from there. It was fine. So I guess you could get away with it. However, I did wish I had more variety and more options at that resupply point. In Idaho and Montana, um, we sent a box to Lima and I was very, very glad that we did. The only resupply option there is like a big gas station and it's definitely catered to people on road trips. Like it is stocked as a gas station, not as like a through hiker gas station. You could certainly make it work again. like. You could throw some resupply together. However, it's, you know, gonna be like a lot of chips and snacks and beef jerky. And for me, I just want a little bit more variety and some more real dinners and stuff than what you could get there. I would recommend at least getting like a supplemental box sent to Lima, maybe one with like your dinners and lunches, and then you could do the rest at the gas station. Ledore, Idaho is another place that we sent a supplemental box. And usually these were ones where we would just tell our family like, hey, can you send us dinners and lunches? Um, and I was glad that we did that. There was a reasonable resupply at the general store there, but again, it was more pricey and less options than what I would want to do as a full resupply. Finally, we sent a box to East Glacier. There are definitely grocery stores there. They're a bit of a walk from where most through hikers stay. Um, so it's kind of nice to have your resupply in a box already. Plus you're probably gonna be sending yourself some like logistical things for the end of the trail if you're hiking northbound. So that's one place that I probably would still send a box even though there is kind of a decent amount of resupply options there. Out of all of these locations, to more directly answer this question, I think the worst and hardest resupply would either be Pi Town or Lima. In Pi Town, you truly have no options um, besides hitchhiking out of town. And in Lima, you're stuck with like a giant gas station that is not currently catering towards through hikers. Herbivore Hiker asked how easy would a vegan be able to resupply without mailing boxes? And I think 
the consensus stays the same. There are a lot of small towns and there are a lot of low selection resupply points. So I would definitely send boxes to all the places that I mentioned and maybe consider supplemental boxes to some of the smaller towns along the way as well, just because there are smaller grocery stores, smaller gas stations that you're gonna be resupplying from and you wanna make sure that you're still getting the food that you need. Moving on to water questions. Did you ever run out of water on the CDT? I actually did run out of water a few times on the CDT due to no other reason than my own stupidity and lack of foresight. I ran out of water on the way out of Grants, New Mexico. Um, I got distracted because we were hiking straight out of town with like a big group of friends. And I think I just kind of like forgot that I needed to look at where our first water source was and sort of just assumed there would be one within, you know, five to 10 miles. So I only packed out like a liter and a half. It turns out that our first water source was not for 16 miles and it was a hot afternoon and I definitely paid the price. I was very thirsty by the time I finally got to the cow trough. Um, so it was like a huge climb, really hot afternoon. And I went through that liter and a half very quickly to the point where like most of us actually made that mistake that day. We just kind of didn't think about it. We were having too much fun and that was almost really bad, but we did make it to a cow trough and we all ended up kind of deciding to stay there instead of hiking up to Mount Taylor, which had originally been the plan. And I think that was ended up being the right move. But yeah, ran out of water was not fun. I also ran out of water one day in Colorado when I forgot to check again where our next water source was. Um, we had started that morning at a lake, um, but I just kind of got lulled into a false sense of security. Being in Colorado, you kind of just assume there's gonna be water. But the thing about hiking the CDT is you are atop the divide a lot of the time, especially in Colorado. Um, this is also true in Idaho. And what happens when you're atop the divide is all the water is running down down. So you don't really cross any water sources because they're all below you. Um, and so I only had like a liter for maybe like 10 to 12 miles that day. It was in the morning. It was okay. But again, it wasn't fun. Most of the time I did carry a generous amount of water because I was too afraid of becoming dehydrated. But another area that this can really sneak up on you is in Idaho. So be sure to start checking those water sources especially in New Mexico, especially in the Great Divide Basin, and especially um, on the border with Idaho. There's also a sneaky dry stretch right after San Luis Peak in Colorado. In a semi-related question, someone asked how bad are the water sources on the CDT and how to survive the CDT as a water snob. Um, and I will say that the water on the CDT is certainly not as nice as the PCT or I imagine the AT. Again, can't really speak from experience there. You can afford to be a little bit more picky, I feel like on the PCT and the water sources are certainly much more frequent, although there are dry stretches on that trail as well. However, as long as you pay attention and plan and have adequate carrying capacity, that's huge because even if you know that there's not a water source for 25 miles, if you only have three liters of capacity, that's probably not gonna be enough. I think it's survivable. I would personally recommend at least five liters of carrying capacity in New Mexico in the basin. I used five liters worth several times. Again, don't get lulled into a false sense of security um, in Yellowstone because as soon as you hit the Idaho border, it dries out and you're gonna need carrying capacity again. As far as being a water snob though, you're either gonna have to take a lot of extra time to filter, carry a lot more in between sources so that you can skip sources, or to be frank, get over it. There will be nasty sources that you have to drink from that are like the only source in, you know, a 60 mile stretch. And in my opinion, that's kind of the fun of the CDT. It wouldn't be the CDT if it wasn't a little bit miserable. So as masochistic as it sounds, I kind of came to enjoy how nasty the water sources would look sometimes because I knew I could handle that. Like I had the right setup. I could make sure that I could make that water safe to drink. And it kind of became a fun laugh between your fellow through hikers. Another day on the CDT, another pond filled with cow shit that we have to drink from. But overall, I do think that the water sources on the CDT and how like terrible they are is a, a little bit overblown. Like there's ways to drink water perfectly accessible, perfectly fine. Um, I don't think it's quite as bad as the reputation makes it seem. Next up, we are talking trail towns. People ask what is the best trail town on the CDT and what trail town can we simply not miss? I personally love trail towns. They are, in my opinion, one of the best parts of through hiking a trail. When else in my entire life would I have ever visited Lima, Montana and had the best steak of my life? 
or Rollins, Wyoming and gotten the worst hangover of my life. These aren't places you would typically go and there's a lot to be seen in trail towns. CDT trail towns specifically are kind of a special breed because a lot of them don't yet fully know about the trail. Like some locals will know, some don't. Um, it's kind of hit or miss. And each state I think has distinctly different vibes along the CDT. And it's honestly pretty hard for me to narrow it down to just one trail town. So I'm gonna go over like each state and which ones I really like. In New Mexico, despite Pie Town being like one of the worst resupplies, I think it's a can't miss town on the CDT. There's something really unique and quirky about it that just makes it part of the CDT experience. And I think a lot of that has to do with the toaster house. Unfortunately, Ida passed away this past year and she was a lot of what made the toaster house really special. So I do hope that it has that same spirit moving forward. And I would definitely recommend a visit as long as it's still running. Um, and again, hopefully the new caretakers carry on Ida's spirit because that was definitely what made that town very special as well as obviously all of the pie. Reserve New Mexico is an optional stop. A lot of people did not stop there and hiked straight through it. However, it's in the middle of a really long stretch and I really couldn't fathom not having a break at that point. And it was right after we walked through an active forest fire, it was just very much needed. And the locals there ended up being incredible. Like we had so much fun in that town. Um, the place that we stayed was awesome. And I'm really just very happy that we ended up hanging out in Reserve New Mexico. I think we took a double zero there actually. And it was a lot of fun. In Colorado, um, I definitely loved Lake City, Colorado. It's not really an optional stop. Like you're gonna wanna stop there after hiking all the way from Chama, but it's charming and it's remote and it's one of the last little mountain towns in Colorado that hasn't been overtaken by commercialization. Another must stop in Colorado, in my opinion, is Leadville. With the way that towns start popping up like left and right in central Colorado, I think some people might opt to skip Leadville just because it's around a lot of other towns, um, but I would definitely recommend making that one of the ones you stop at. It's the home to Melanzano, which is that fleece that has like a culty following in the through hiker world. And it also has a great hostel and a lot of different food options. And I just, I don't know, there's something about Leadville that's just cute and quirky. It's also like one of the highest towns or maybe the highest town in the United States. I have honorable mentions in Colorado just because I really do love a lot of the towns here. Um, I'm a little bit biased, obviously, since I live here, but just to make it a little bit more brief, I would definitely also stop at Pagosa Springs, Salida, Twin Lakes, and Grand Lake. In Wyoming, Lander, Wyoming was definitely my favorite town in that state. Lander is the gateway to the Wind River Range and it is an awesome visit. It has everything you could need as a through hiker. There's some really great outfitters there just because it is so close to the Wind River Range and it has great food and a lot of different options for where to stay. Um, overall, I just, Lander's a cool town and I would go back even not on a through hike. Pinedale is also really cool and I have visited Pinedale before, but I skipped it on the CDT. But if you're doing like the Wind River Hire Out or something like that, definitely recommend Pinedale as well. Idaho and Montana. Lidor, Idaho was one of the most fun towns that we stopped in, honestly, on the trail. Um, and I had to give Idaho at least one mention. I think we just didn't really stop in many Idaho towns. When you're on the border, you end up stopping in Montana, even if you're hiking in Idaho. But the Mustang Inn definitely made our stay in Lidor. It's a family starting like a little bed and breakfast and it was perfect for hikers. Everything is so close together. I really love trail towns where everything is walkable because it's so small and Lidor definitely fits that bill. I'm Montana, again, um, a town that is scarce as far as resupply options, definitely still made my list of favorite trail towns because it's so small and I had the best steak of my life at the Pete Saloon and Steakhouse. There's only one place to stay and there's that one gas station. The town kind of gives you the vibes of like, this is what through hiking is about. These tiny little Western towns that you would literally never visit otherwise. Next is Anaconda, Montana. Pintler's Portal Hostel is honestly one of the best hostels that I've ever stayed at and Anaconda is worth a stop just for that. Next is Augusta, Montana. Again, this is one of those towns that just like embodies what through hiking is to me. It's so small that everything is right next door to each other. The locals are great. Um, there's a little bit of town drama if you happen to get lucky like we did. Um, we stayed in this 
weird, quirky, but big Airbnb that was super cheap. So we each paid like $20 and all stayed for two nights, which was a lot of fun. Honorable mention to Darby. If you watch Yellowstone, that's where the Yellowstone Ranch is, which is kind of cool to see when you're driving into town. And also the Montana Cafe definitely lived up to the hype for me. You'll see it in the far out comments. Um, giant pancakes, delicious breakfast, worth at least two stops. Next up is questions about preparation. Specifically, the first one is about how to prepare for the Colorado snowpack this year on the CDT. And according to Post Holder, the Colorado snowpack on the CDT is currently below average, which makes sense compared to what I've been seeing up here in Summit County. Um, we definitely haven't been getting as much snow this year. And it's also, according to Post Holder, currently lower snowpack than it was this time in 2022, which is the year that I hiked. And I think if you're hiking northbound and you hit the San Juans in early June, it'll definitely be doable. Um, you'll probably want an ice axe and spikes, but considering we went through in late May on a year with a higher snowpack, I think you'll be totally fine. That being said, it was melting really fast the year that we went through. Like you can see on the graph, it's like just a steep drop off, um, which doesn't always happen. There are a lot of like windstorms that blew dirt onto the snow and then made it melt faster. Um, so definitely keep an eye on it still, but I think if you make it to the San Juans in early June, you should be good to go. I will say though that the San Juans are sneakier than a trail like the PCT because the CDT tries to stay atop the divide as much as possible, whereas the PCT follows a more of a pass and valley route through the Sierra. So you could kind of prepare, like we have a pass, that's gonna be a lot of snow, we'll deal with it, you know, as we get higher in elevation. The CDT kind of stays high in elevation and it's really like the north and northeasterly facing slopes that are gonna to start to pose problems for you. Um, and so those are a little harder to plan and monitor throughout the day. Besides bringing the right tools, like an ice axe and micro spikes and knowing how and when to use them, I I would say the other thing you can do to prepare is by having good topo maps so that you can actually just avoid some of the steeper snow slopes if they seem too sketchy to cross. I did that several times where there were reports of really steep and um, kind of precarious snow situations and I just looked at my topos and figured out how to navigate around it um, so I just didn't have to deal with it. Although that was a lot of work and extra time so just be prepared for that. Another question I got was how long should a first time through hiker prepare and train for the CDT? And honestly, this is gonna vary a ton by person. I do think the CDT is more physically challenging than any other trail that I've done so far. Um, so I would definitely put a lot of time and effort as much as you can into training for it, especially as a first time through hiker. However, I knew many first time through hikers that I met on the CDT. Um, it was their first trail and they rocked it, they crushed it. So it's absolutely possible. I would say just get in as good of shape as you can, especially try and get miles in with your backpack on. and you're gonna be fine. Next is what is the hardest part of the CDT logistically? I personally think that the hardest part of it, logistically speaking, is following the trail <laughs> in certain sections. Because it's so new and things are changing and you know there's not as much awareness about it, I think there's a high need for trail maintenance in certain sections. And sometimes the trail does just disappear altogether. I never truly felt like I was lost. It's just like more annoying than anything. Like it gets a little bit bushwhacky or you kind of have to like keep an eye on your map to make sure you're continuing in the right direction rather than relying on like a trail being there. So it certainly can cause a lot of frustration even if you're not getting truly lost. I do think that over time this is improving every single year. And like I said, it's more of an annoyance than anything. Getting to the Southern terminus of the CDT is also certainly a logistical challenge. It's a long drive down a very rough dirt road like two plus hours down dirt roads and the closest town is Lordsburg and the directions are a little bit confusing and your GPS can definitely send you the wrong way. I personally would definitely recommend using the CDTC's shuttle um, over having like a family member or friend take you just because they know what they're doing, they know the way there and they have capable vehicles. If you have a friend who's like fairly confident in their vehicle and really wants to take you or you really want to be taken by someone, I would just say have maps downloaded, have several different directions downloaded um, and make sure you are really like paying attention because it's kind of easy to get lost. Next up is gear questions. What backpacking gear would you have changed on the CDT? Specifically, someone asked one thing that you wish you had brought or one thing you wish you had left behind. This one's kind of easy for me. I wish I had left behind one of the sleeping pads that I carried. I carried a foam pad and a blow up pad, which was redundant and unnecessary. One thing that I wish I had brought was an Urzak. I was resistant to the idea at first because of the added cost and added weight, um, but honestly, it got really annoying and sometimes 
really difficult to hang your food every night in grizzly country. When you're hiking 30 miles a day, it's just another chore added on to go and have to hang your food properly in a tree. There's caveats here, which I'll get to, but especially in the West, a lot of times it's these pine trees that don't have the best branches. So you end up having to do like a two tree hang or walking around a lot to find a tree with a reasonable branch to do an adequate hang. And so if you have like no other option, it can be sometimes dangerous, especially in grizzly country. And Ursac would have made several of my nights a lot easier, although I would still hang in her sack in a lot of scenarios. Like if I saw a bear activity that day, I would definitely still want to hang my earth sack because even if you tie an earth sack properly to a tree, if a bear smells it and they start like pawing at it and getting at it, um, your food is probably still going to be ruined even if they don't get the reward of actually eating it, um, which is good. It saves the bear. but on the CDT, you could be several days away from a town and another resupply and you might have a bag full of inedible food. So if I was nervous, I would probably still hang in her sack, but it would have been nice to have it still on nights where one, there were no trees or two, there were no good branches um, to still have some way to protect my food. And then just to add on to this question, one thing I was really happy that I brought was the sun umbrella, especially in New Mexico and the Great Divide Basin. Somebody asked what my pack weight was on the CDT and my base weight was around 13 pounds. That I think was higher because of the camera gear that I brought. Without that camera gear, it would probably have been closer to 10 pounds. This next section is questions about motivation. Somebody asked what are the most common reasons that people quit the CDT and how do you overcome that? This is purely speculation because I don't really know the most common pe reason that people quit the CDT. I feel like a lot of people come out there pretty prepared because they're experienced and they've probably through hiked before. Um, but if I had to guess, my guess would be that the most common reason is injury and how you're going to prevent injuries. Honestly, on the CDT is proper training, having the right shoes, lightening your pack and listening to your body when things start to get kind of tough. Also think that people probably quit the CDT because it can be pretty miserable at times. The CDT, in my opinion, just takes the brutality of through hiking up another level in basically every single regard. So if you're out there for like a big, happy, fun adventure, I don't know that the CDT is going to be the right trail. It certainly provides that, but there is a lot of challenge along the way. Combine that with the fact that there are a lot less hikers on the CDT, I think morale is just something that is tougher on that trail. In the moments where I was especially miserable, I tried to remember why I came out there in the first place, and that was to prove to myself that I could do something really hard like the CDT, and quitting would have obviously been proving to myself that I couldn't do it. So. In a nutshell, I'm very competitive and stubborn and that helped me through the misery of the CDT. Next question is how did you stay motivated? Just kind of related to my answer of the previous one. Really, when I was having a bad day, I reminded myself that everything is temporary. I heard this on a podcast that Quadzilla did with Backpacker Radio and it really, really helped me. No matter what the miserable thing was that day, it would eventually end and I would just remind myself of that. I would also remind myself in like smaller bouts of misery that I can do like basically anything for whatever that distance was, usually like shorter than a mile. So like if it was a climb for another half a mile and I was like really, really struggling, I was like, well, I can do anything for half a mile. It's just half a mile. So kind of like breaking it down into smaller chunks made it a little more digestible. And then finally, I constantly tried to remember how much tougher I was actively getting by doing these miserable things. There were so many days that honestly did just flat out suck and I kept saying to myself just think how much tougher you'll be when this is done. Um, related to those questions as well, what was your worst day on the CDT and how did you learn from it? To be honest, there were a lot of really hard days on the CDT as I sort of touched on. Um, it definitely was a really tough trail for me. And there were more than a few days where I did contemplate quitting. One day that really sticks out to me was in the Great Divide Basin um, where I'm pretty sure I was dealing with some sort of heat illness. I was getting rashes on my legs every single day. Um, I was very nauseous. I was having diarrhea every afternoon at like 11 like clockwork. And if you have ever been to the basin or seen it, you know that there's nowhere to do that privately. So that's a little bit of a morale issue when you're like, I need to go do business and somebody might walk up on me because there's no trees for 80 miles. And so I guess I'm just gonna like walk off to the side of the trail as far as I can and hope for the best. So I was nauseous, super hot, really low on energy. And uh, simultaneously we were trying to push really big days because we didn't want to be in the basin any longer. We got to a water source on this day. It was like one of the few like open water sources. It was like a big reservoir. And I remember saying to myself, if someone drives by, I'm gonna ask for a ride 
ride and I'm gonna get in and I'm gonna get out of this hell hole. There aren't a lot of cars that come by in the basin. It's really just like big, vast, open nothingness, um, but there are ranchers who come through, so it was a possibility. And funnily enough, a car did come by and I could not bring myself to put my thumb out in that moment. And it was in that moment that I realized I'm way too stubborn to quit this trail. And after that, I kind of stopped entertaining the idea as much. Um, I realized I'm, I'm not gonna do it. Like, there's no reason spending all this mental energy contemplating bailing when I know that I'm too stubborn to do so. So I really let my stubbornness take me pretty far and it reinforced that everything is temporary mindset because we ended up getting through the basin and actually look back on it pretty fondly, surprisingly. You are also rewarded with the Wind River Range right after the basin and I kind of have this theory that for every ounce of beauty you get on the CDT, you pay for it in brutality. So every view you get, you earn and it's a really accomplished feeling at the end of the day. A related question someone asked was your favorite salty nicknames for the trail during midday meltdowns and I don't think I ever really called it anything specific although now I'm inspired to develop some things I know we just like would laugh a lot and be like that's the CDT for you like things would get really bad and then something else would happen to just like escalate it to be even worse and we were like well that's the fucking CDT for you. Someone asked, how do you get the most out of the CDT? They wanna know how to enjoy their hike to the fullest. And I would say to put it simply, my advice would be to take the alternates, stop at trail towns, make sure you're in shape beforehand. And other than that, it's largely out of your control. I think embracing the fact that you can do nothing about how much certain days will suck and try and laugh about how bad it gets. Like how I kind of talked about earlier because it will get bad. Some of my favorite moments on the CDT were literally where we were having the crappiest day possible, just like slogging through some miserable sections of trail, looking at each other like, man, we're tired. Like, when's this gonna end? And then it would just start hailing. And then at that point you just, have to laugh because of course, of course it started hailing during this miserable section of trail. And honestly, I got a lot of enjoyment out of that. Next are questions comparing the CDT to the PCT. The first person asked, what is the sun and desert intensity like on the CDT versus the PCT? Um, and in general, I found the sun and desert both to be a lot more intense on the CDT. The CDT follows more desert floor, especially for the first 100 miles than the PCT. On the PCT, you're kind of like go up and there are like some shrubs and trees and it feels a little bit more like high desert country whereas the CDT feels like low sandy desert. Think more sand, less trees, and less water and a lot more cows. I did find the desert on the CDT to be a lot hotter even though I hiked through in April versus I hiked through the desert in May on the PCT. It is worth noting that I had a very wet year on the PCT so that could have contributed to cooler temperatures but overall I felt like the CDT was just like the PCT desert turned up a couple notches. You also do have a lot more sun exposure on the CDT, just objectively. Um, the average elevation on the trail in Colorado is above 10,000 feet, which means you're way more exposed to the sun, you're above tree line more often, and you definitely want to make sure that you're prioritizing sun protection. And then just to cover like the main differences between the CDT and the PCT, I could probably do an entire video just on this. So I'm gonna make it quick, high level summary kind of bullet points. I think the CDT is harder logistically, physically, and mentally. I think the CDT has more remote sections more often than the PCT. The CDT definitely still has less people. The CDT permits are easier to get from a competitive standpoint, but logistically you're gonna need to do more work. It's not just one permit, it's several that you need to like string together. And for like Yellowstone and Glacier, you really probably can't do it until you get there. So that's another factor logistically that you have to worry about. Whereas the PCT, you just get the one and you're good for the whole trail. The people in CDT trail towns are definitely less likely to know what you're doing, although awareness is spread. The CDT has harsher weather. I experienced a lot more storms, a lot more hail, and a lot more intense sun on the CDT than the PCT. The CDT is a lot higher in elevation for longer, just by the nature of the way the trail is constructed. You are up there for a long time, so altitude is definitely a bigger factor. The CDT tread is a lot tougher. Experiencing the CDT is why I finally understood why people harped so much about the PCT being graded for horses. You will get why that's a big deal once you hike the CDT. And the CDT has more sections where trail is harder to follow. So 
just in general, it's kind of taking everything up a level. Next, people asked about community on the CDT. What is their community? What is the culture like? Um, and there certainly is community on the CDT. And thanks to the efforts of the trail towns and the CDTC, it is growing every single year. It's certainly less than the other trails, but again, it's growing and people definitely recognize what the CDT is and are starting to create more and more community in trail towns. I also happen to be in the 2022 through hiking bubble, which anecdotally, according to a lot of the locals, was twice the size of any bubble they'd seen before. Just for reference, to me, that bubble felt similar to being in the last group of through hikers on the PCT in 2019. So for comparison, a big CDT bubble felt like a group of stragglers on a more popular trail. We were definitely able to find community on the CDT because we were in that bubble and we really enjoyed it without ever feeling like campsites were overcrowded or towns were filled to the brim with through hikers. If you're specifically looking for a social trail, I probably wouldn't recommend the CDT just because your experience could vary a lot. We talked to hikers who were a few days, a few weeks ahead of us who had a totally different, very solitary experience compared to what we did in the bubble. However, if you are hiking the CDT anyway and you're hoping for a social experience, I think it's definitely possible that you will get it. I will say trail magic was almost non-existent on the CDT. We got it once in the desert, but in general, don't expect trail magic out there. Next, addressing navigation. What navigation apps did you use? I sort of mentioned this in the alternate section, but I used Guthook, aka Far Out. I would say most hikers did use Far Out and then that is definitely still it for the CDT. However, there is, and I think should be, a more use of supplemental maps um, than there is on other trails. I, in addition to Jonathan Lay's maps, which I mentioned already and used on Avenza, I liked having another navigation app like Gaia to download and use Topo Maps for um, whenever I needed it. Next up is questions about bears. How did you deal with bears on the CDT? I used a lot of different strategies for dealing with bears, especially in grizzly country. Um, one, I always carry bear spray in grizzly country and kept it completely accessible on the hip belt of my fanny pack. So it's no good to you if it's in your mesh, you're not gonna be able to reach it in time. We added a dinner break to our day um, and usually ate dinner about a mile before camp compared to non-grizz country where we would typically eat at camp. If we didn't have time to do this or we kind of like ended up camping earlier than we expected, we would walk really far away from where we were sleeping to eat. We hung our food and smellables every single night. This is kind of like a non-negotiable for me in grizzly country. I tried not to night hike alone. I would periodically make noise, yell out, bang my trekking poles together if I was alone during the day and especially if I saw signs of bear activity. And as I mentioned before, I wish I had brought a nursack just so I had that extra layer of protection for my food. I will say that eventually you get used to all the bear precautions and it's not as overwhelming as it might seem to begin with. And you really are very rarely probably going to see bears. And that leads me to the next question of how many bears did I see on the CDT and how did they act? I saw four bears that I can remember on the CDT, two of which were just like bear butts that I saw running away. So I'm really not sure if they were grizzlies or black bears, but I think at least one of them was definitely a black bear. The other one harder to tell, um, but both of those just like ran away as soon as they heard me. One of them though was a huge, huge, huge black bear that I saw in Colorado. I was looking down at my mapping app at a junction. And when I looked up, I noticed there was just this giant bear like 75 yards away from me. Um, I instinctively sort of took a step back and then I remembered you're not supposed to do that. So then I tried to make myself really big, like put my arms up in the air and yelled and then the bear immediately ran away. So that one behaved how you would expect and how would you would want a bear to behave when you encounter it in the backcountry. There was another bear, however, another black bear that I encountered in Montana. Also on like a gravel road, it was like probably a hundred yards ahead of me. And that one, it looked really young um, or small-ish. Um, but it was without a mom. It was maybe old enough to be solo. So I wasn't sure if there was a mom around or not, but I would yell at it and it would just like kind of turn around and look at me and like stop walking. We were walking the same direction. So I didn't really want it to stop or turn around. I kind of wanted it to like bolt off in the other direction. But instead of doing that, it was just like turning around and looking at me. So I eventually I just stopped yelling at it and kind of slowed my pace so I kept my distance from it and I just waited for it to eventually meander off into the woods which it did and um it was fine. Josh also saw a grizzly cub and mom in Glacier which was pretty scary um he was walking on the trail 
and they were like right on the trail. Luckily, some rangers got his attention and told him to give them a very wide berth. He had his bear spray out, did that, and they were literally like right in front of our camp. Um, and I think if we had been alone, we probably would have kept walking that night, but luckily there were a lot of people at that campsite. There were rangers there with horses and they didn't seem nervous about it. So we stayed, they had been like digging up ground squirrels. So um, that was kind of cool, but a little bit nerve wracking for our very last night on trail. But yeah, those were the bear encounters that I had on CDT, nothing um, really scary. In conclusion, I hope this is helpful for any prospective CDT hikers. If you have a question about any given topic, please feel free to leave it in the comments and I'll do my best to answer. Of course, like I said, any given year on any given trail is going to be different and your experience may vary greatly from mine, but I hope that sharing what I experienced helps you prepare even just a little bit for, for what I believe is the adventure of a lifetime. The CDT is as magical as it is brutal. And if you get to spend even a fraction of time on a fraction of that trail, you should consider yourself a very lucky human being. Thanks for watching. Bye.